Okay, um, we're going to be back in Hebrews 4 again this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11 again. If you'll remember last week, we addressed the statement that God makes about those in the wilderness of Israel when he says, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And we addressed what it is for God to swear in his wrath, that wrath has to be a part of who God is and the fact that what that means is that because God has made this promise that they shall not enter my rest, that God is promising not to give these people faith because we know that all of us by nature are born in a state of unbelief And we are completely disposed to all wickedness. We completely hate God. We hate our neighbor. And that's the only thing that we can do by nature. So unless God gives us the gift of faith, we will never believe. And so when God says, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. This is synonymous with God saying, I have swore in my wrath. I will not give them faith. I will not give them belief. And so because God swore his wrath that he will not give these people belief, this is God saying that he has eternally hated these people and he has covenanted to judge them. He has promised to judge them. And then we also talked about what that wrath is. And how it is displayed for eternity upon those who die in unbelief. This means that the Lord Jesus Christ did not die for them. He did not die to buy them back. He never loved them. And that is exactly what he will tell them on the day that he says, depart from me. When he says, I never knew you. Because we know that the word know means loved. We find that in the Old Testament. That's the only other way that scripture uses the word no. And so these people being hated of God were eternally destined to be judged by God because wrath is a part of who God is and God has purposed from the very foundation of the world to demonstrate who he is in both his wrath and his mercy. And the cross of Christ is where that is supremely displayed. And so because Christ did not die for these people, God does not give these people faith. And therefore, they do not ever enter his rest. We read in Revelation chapter 14, it says they have no rest day or night. Why? Because they never entered God's rest. rest. And so they're never given rest, true rest. And they're made to drink the wine of the wrath of God. And that's where we talked about how God judges them justly for who they are in the lake of fire by pouring out his wrath on them. Jesus said it's the place where the fire is not quenched, the worm does not die, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we know in Revelation 19 that God's elect praise him in his judgment. And so we should praise him for that judgment here. And so let's look at, again, we're going to look at some more aspects of this passage. We're going to read through it again, and then we're going to summarize it, and we're going to talk specifically this morning about rest and what this passage is talking about when it references the Sabbath and when it references rest. And... and what that means. So let's read Hebrews chapter 4 verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he said has said 
So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. All right, so we're going to summarize here a little bit and bring us up to speed with where we're at. So he's addressing those who may yet still be in unbelief. We see he says, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. And so, what is, who is he addressing? Those who may have seemed to have come short of it. We talked last week about how these, these letters in the New Testament were read publicly in churches. They met in houses. They, they met in various places. We know they didn't meet like people say, who say they're a part of the church meet today in these red brick, brick buildings with a steeple. But the church is the people of God, and they met in public places. And we know from 1 Corinthians 14 that there were those who came in who didn't even profess faith. They were unbelievers. And we know that among those who do profess faith and those who have true faith, that there will be those who profess faith whose faith is false. And that is specifically who he is addressing here, those who are in the congregation who may seem to have come short of God's rest, meaning the faith that they're professing is false. And we know that in the context of the whole of the letter of Hebrews, as we have discussed that there was, the author addresses later on he's, in his explanation of the priesthood and the sacrificial system, there, the way that he addresses them, there was more than likely the possibility that they were being tempted to go back into the temple that was still standing when this letter was written and offer sacrifices. And the author will explain that there's no more sacrifice for sins. That... um the sacrifices that were offered continually were offered continually because they could never purify or perfect the worshiper in conscience. Because if they could have, if they could have removed sins, if they could have given forgiveness, then they would have ceased to be offered. They would have stopped offering the sacrifices. I mean, that's the logical conclusion. The fact that they had to continually be up in the temple offering the animals, offering the sacrifices, was indicative to the fact that the worshiper, the one who would approach God, could never be purified in conscience. He could never have forgiveness of sins through these animals, and so they continually had to be offered. But Christ was offered once and for all. And so believers, having believed that truth, for them it, to go back in the temple would be to go against that truth. And I think that's what the author is addressing when he's addressing those who may have seemed to come short of the promise. The promise of what? The promise of entering his rest. And we're going to read all throughout this, really, and all throughout the New Testament, we see this type of reasoning. There's always, it's like next verse starts with a four. Therefore, four, therefore. When we read a four or a therefore, what is he doing? He's explaining why 
you could throw in the word why. The, he's saying, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. Why? For, indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Now look, here's another for. In other words, why? So he just answered the question of why should we fear lest any of you seem to come short of this promise because the gospel was preached to us as well as to those in the wilderness. And the majority of those in the wilderness fell. God killed them. They did not enter the land, which was a picture of true rest. That's what it was a picture of. It's a picture of our true rest that we have in Christ that will ultimately be fulfilled in the world to come. That's what the Sabbath day pictures, where we will have eternal rest in Christ. And so, but the, but the author's reasoning here is that let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of this promise, lest any of you who profess faith demonstrate that your faith is false. That would, what it would, that would be what it would mean to come short of the promise that your faith has not been given of God, but it is a counterfeit faith. And his reasoning of why we should fear is because those who heard the same gospel of, as us in the wilderness, they fell in unbelief. And so the author reasons that because there were those who had a false faith in the wilderness, we can say about God's church that there's going to be the same. There's going to be those who profess faith, but indeed who do not have faith. Now he's given, uh, he's answering why he said verse 2 and verse 3, because he, he begins that verse by saying 4. So what is he explaining here? He says, he, he's just made the statement that the word which they heard did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we have, who have believed do enter that rest. And so the point is, is they wouldn't have died in the wilderness if they would have believed. How do we know that their faith is false? That's what he's explaining. Because if you believe, you enter the rest. If they would have believed, they would have entered the land, which was their rest. Um, not true rest, but it was the shadow of rest. It was the picture of rest. They would have actually entered the picture. They would have actually went into the land if they would have believed the truth. But because the word they heard was not united in faith, they fell. They fell short of it. Short of what? The promise. What was the promise that God gave Israel? I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey and you're going to go into it. But God, what? He killed the majority of all of them. They, they died. They fell. Only a few entered. And so that's his reasoning there. Because we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And so we see here, as we talked about last week, that he is reasoning from the negative, he's making the point that because God made this statement, God made this covenant that he swore in his wrath that they shall not enter my rest, um, meaning that he would never give them faith. The opposite is also true, that God has swore in his love that his people will enter his rest. Therefore, he gives his elect faith and those that he gives faith enter that rest. And then he makes a statement, although it, the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So, although this is true, that his works were finished in a sense from the foundation of the world. Now, how do we know that his works were finished from the foundation of the world? That's what he's going to answer here in verse 4. 4. All, let's, let's go back a minute. Verse 3. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the wor world. Or why do we know that his works were finished from the foundation of the world? He has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Both of those statements that the author cites from Genesis and Psalm 95 
we can infer from those statements that we know that God's works were finished from the foundation of the world. That's what he's giving the explanation to. Because he said this, and he said this, we know that his works were finished from the foundation of the world. So when we read in Genesis 2, that it says that um, he spoke in the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. When we read that, we need to think, now there's other truths there too, but one of the truths that the author of Hebrews finds in that statement in Genesis 2 is that we know because God says that he rested on the seventh day from all his works, that, that his works were finished then. So, so how do we view that? Well, it's in, in, it's in the realm of decree or what God predestines because God has determined to do this because God has purpose to do this and we know that that purpose is eternal. It didn't dawn on God one day that he thought, I might create the heavens and the earth and I think that when I create them, I'm going to demonstrate that no, it, all of that didn't like occur to God. It was eternal. It's always been. And so when God created, he created with this purpose in mind. And in view of that purpose, his works are finished. But his works are playing themselves, or his works are playing out in time. So his works are as good as done in the mind of God but yet they still play themselves out. That's why he uses the word although when he begins this thought. thought. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, and, but then in the middle of this statement, he includes a why they are. Why are his works finished from the foundation of the world? world? How do we know that his works are finished? The other statement of how we know his works are finished is that he, he said... Uh, in Psalm 95, they shall not enter my rest. And we know, as we said earlier, that is the decree of God to not give faith to some and to damn them, to judge them, to demonstrate his wrath in them. That's part and parcel with the decree of God to save some. And, and, and ultimately speaking, the decree of God to do both is purposed in God's purpose to demonstrate who he is and because God loves himself and he because God loves himself his trinity like we talked about last week he has purpose to make known who he is as father son and holy spirit okay so because of this we know his works are finished from the foundation of the world then the author goes on since therefore it remains in other words, because his works are still being played out in time, since therefore it remains that some must enter it, the rest, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience or unbelief. Again, he designates a certain day saying in David, today, after such a long time as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now, something interesting, we haven't turned to Psalm 95 yet, but if you would turn there, that's where he's citing this statement from that's coupled with God's statement to not give faith to some. That the statement that he made in his wrath that they will not enter his rest. If you turn to Psalm 95, it says in uh, verse 7, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, that they tried me, though they saw my work. Now, is that not interesting that he says we are the people of his pasture? Or you could say 
the sheep of his pasture, because that's the statement he makes next, and the sheep of his hand. Now, what what is significant about bringing up sheep here in Psalm 95? Because immediately after, he says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Who hears his voice? We know in John 10, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, they know me, and they will not follow another. So who, who hears the voice of the shepherd but the sheep? And we know that the sheep are those who are eternally loved of God and not hated. They are those who are the elect of God whom Jesus Christ entered into history and died for. So they are the ones who must enter. Who must enter what? Who must enter the rest? And they are the ones who will hear his voice. They are the ones who will not harden their hearts. And they will come to him. And so the author of Hebrews is using this language. He's, this is a callback to Psalm 95. That's how, more, that's how Jesus understood Psalm 95 when he spoke in John 10. The sheep hearing his voice. It says in verse 7 of Hebrews 4, again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had, been, had given them rest, he would not after have spoken of another day. So in other words, if that was true rest that Joshua gave them when he brought them into the land, then he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. Now, when will we not speak of another day? It will be in the world to come. We will no longer speak of another day then. We will have true rest. We will enter the true Sabbath of God. But since he spoke of another day after Joshua, it remains for some to enter that rest, which is realized now on earth when God gives you faith. You hear the gospel preached and God causes you to be born again and he gives you faith in that gospel. You hear his voice and you go to him in the faith that he has given you and you enter that rest. Your heart is not hardened. And look at what he says. If Joshua had given them rest, then he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Is there a rest for everybody? No. There's not a rest for everybody. We know that some will have no rest day or night. As it says in Revelation 14, they will be made to drink the wine of the wrath of the Lamb of God. <clears throat> but there is a rest for the people of God, for his sheep, for those who are loved. And God causes them, by the power of his own will, to enter that rest. When he gives them a new heart, and we know that the heart is the will, the mind, the inner man, man and he causes them when he gives them a new heart, to believe the voice of the true shepherd. And the voice of the true shepherd is the true gospel, the true good news that is proclaimed. And so the author speaking to those in the church in Israel, who he says, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of the promise if you hear his voice, if you are of his sheep, do not harden your hearts. Do not go back into the temple. Do not leave this faith. And if you, if you, if you have, you need to repent, repent of this. And when I say repent, I mean that you, the author would have been speaking that they needed to repent of their dead works. They needed to repent. And in order for that repentance to occur, they had to be born again. 
He would have been speaking to the, them in the sense if they had went back into the temple, he would have been speaking them in the sense of the fact that they had apostatized. They had, or, or possibly they would have shown that they had never been given faith. As we talked about, there's a difference in between apostasy and false conversion a few weeks ago. And for those who would have demonstrated that their faith was not real or that they had misunderstood the gospel, that they had never made true profession in the gospel, he would have told them that they needed to be born again. They would, they needed to be born of God because they would have been demonstrating that their faith was not real, that they had not understood the gospel of right, uh, right that they thought that the gospel was compatible with their Judaism. And it's completely antithetical to Judaism. It's completely antithetical to the system of the Old Covenant. It's completely antithetical to continuing to doing sacrifices because those sacrifices pictured the Messiah. They continually had to be offered. They could never take away sins. But Christ was offered once for all and he sat down. He quit working. His work was finished. He ascended to the right hand of God and he sat down at the right side of majesty on high after he had made purification for sins. We read that in Hebrews chapter 1. So the author has already made known this truth. And so to go back up in the temple would be a, to trot underfoot the blood of Christ and to disregard it. You know, sacrifices being continually offered uh, it, ha it has its equivalent in works-based religion today. Catholicism possibly being the most obvious in the sense that they actually do teach that Christ is offered over and over again in the Eucharist, in the Lord's Supper. And that's why they don't know how to dispose of the elements of the wine and the bread. They don't know what to do with them if there's leftovers because they really think that that's Christ's body and blood. And they think he's being re-sacrificed over and over again every time they partake of it. Well, if Christ is being re-sacrificed over and over again, how are their sins forgiven? That's just like the animals in the temple. They had to continually be offered. And that was indicative, the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, of the fact that these sacrifices could never take away sins. And so that's basic, they're basically back in the sacrificial system. The Catholics are. And then you have the Protestants who get away from that obvious falsehood. And then within Protestantism, when I say Protestantism, they're supposed to be in protest of the Catholic Church. But they're really not because they still have the same false works-based system. They still believe that they can merit the favor of God through meeting a condition. And that's what a work is. And that will bring us to our next section. I'm jumping a little bit ahead, so I want to go back and read um, the rest of Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. He says in verse 9, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. That's what we just talked about. It's only the people of God. It's only the sheep that there remains a rest for, for those that he died to purchase that rest. Now the author is going to use another four. And he's going to give another reason why. How do we know that there remains a rest for the people of God? For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Now, there's a controversy about this verse. You'll notice in your translations that I think all translations translate the he, the one who has entered his rest, and they use, they use a lowercase h. That means they don't believe, the translators don't believe that the one who has entered his rest is Christ, when that is exactly who it is. 
because the author is given a reason of why there remains a rest for the people of God. Now, if you're going to say that's the one who has believed and entered Christ's rest, you're going to have to explain why my faith is the basis of their remaining a rest for me to enter. I enter through faith, through the gift of faith. How, how can the gift of faith that God gives me be the reason for my entering that rest? It can't be. The one who has established the rest is Christ. The reason why I can enter God's rest is because Christ died on the cross, bore my sin, and put it away. He was the sacrifice. He finished the work that God gave him to do. He established my rest. He established the rest for the people of God. And that is what the author is seeking to explain in verse 10. In verse 9 it says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. And in verse 10 he begins by using the word for. Which means he's explaining verse 9. So he's giving a reason of why there remains a rest for the people of God. Why is there a rest for the sheep? Because Christ accomplished my rest. And so when he says for he, that he needs to be capital H. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Or you could say God the Father did from his. And so what does that mean? Well, when Christ died, he entered his rest. When the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross and resurrected on the first day of the week, he entered his rest. Because the cross of Christ is not merely an act, as we've talked about, of salvation. It accomplishes multiple things. And one of those things that the cross of Christ accomplishes is the new creation, which one day he will come and he will establish. He will burn this earth with fire and he will make a new heavens and a new earth. That is what we just said a moment ago that the land of Canaan represented. The world to come. It wasn't true rest. It was a picture of the true rest. You have the exodus. God redeemed his people out of the world. Egypt represents the world. He redeemed them out of the world through the blood of the lamb. They had the Passover. They sacrificed the lamb. They applied the blood of the lamb to their doorpost and the angel passed over their houses. And so he redeemed them out through that. And then he brings them into the wilderness where they dwell in tents, a tent being a, a non-permanent dwelling place. What does the Bible call this world for the Christian? It says we're aliens and sojourners here, meaning this is not our home. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, he refers to our bodies as tents. He says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And he makes the point that that's where our home is, that our citizenship is in heaven, Paul says to the church in Philippi. And so when Israel was in the wilderness, that pictured the Christian's journey after he's converted, after he's redeemed out of Egypt, after he's redeemed out of the world, he's in a wilderness, so to speak. He's in a non-temporary, or a, a non-permanent, I'm, I'm using the wrong word. He's, he's in a temporary dwelling place. He's not in his home any longer. He's been brought into the wilderness. And it says, it says to do what? To test them or to purify them. And so God's people are 
sanctified while they're still in this world. The Holy Spirit works in them to will and to do to his good pleasure. And he causes them to be conformed into the image of Christ. And it's not a direct upward spiral, but it's a work that God produces in his people. He reproves them when they sin. He uses the, uses their sin in their lives for their good. But the point is, is that that's what the wilderness pictured the Christian's life. And then going into the land would represent glorification where the Christian is brought into the resurrection and the dead are raised and God makes a new heavens and a new earth. And that is where the true rest of God will be. And so getting back to our passage here when he says that there remains therefore a rest for the people of God why for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his and so Jesus inaugurated a new creation when he died that's how he rests from his works as God did from his God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning and on the seventh day he rested. When, when, when his work of creation was done, was accomplished, he rested on the seventh day. And so when Christ's work of creation was done, after he had died and rose again, he rested on the first day of the week. And that's one of the reasons why as Christians, we worship God on the first day of the week. Because that is the Christian Sabbath. That is the Lord's day. We worship him in spirit and in truth on that day because Christ has created anew. And we know that it is being brought to pass that he is subduing the nations through the word of his gospel. He is subjecting all enemies under his feet through the power of his gospel being preached and one day he will return and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. That doesn't mean that they will be saved. It means they will be made to confess the reprobate will that he is Lord and their knees will be broken by the one who rules the nations with a rod of iron. And so Christ rested from his works as God did from his. He inaugurated a new creation that one day will come to pass when he returns again. And that's what we who are here now who believe this gospel, we the Bible describes us as eagerly waiting for him. And that's also later on in the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 10 of Hebrews 4, For he who has entered his rest has also himself ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. So and then he gives his exhortation. Now, in light of the fact that there, that there remains a day of rest for the people of God, let us therefore be diligent to enter. Let us therefore be diligent to persevere, persevere in the faith, to enter that rest. And so there's a sense in which God's people have entered it now. And there's a sense in which we will enter it when he returns again. He has let us partake of it now, have a taste of it now. He has given the Holy Spirit unto us as a deposit, as a guarantee. And then one day he will return and we will truly partake of it. So now let's ask a, a few questions. When God's people enter his rest on earth, what does that mean? What is rest? Rest, was, what's the opposite of rest? To, 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 uh, to work. If you're not resting, you're working. That's pretty simple. And so when God's people enter the rest of Christ, they enter his rest.
that would be that would mean that they cease from working. How? Does it mean I quit my job? Does it mean I stop laboring uh, at my home? Does it, etc.? Is that what it means? No, it's speaking of a spiritual rest. And so that would also mean that it's speaking of spiritual working. And so what is a work in the physical? I go to work. I do my job at work. And in return for doing what my employer asks of me, I receive compensation. So a work to work is to do something in order to receive something. Meeting a condition to obtain. Okay, is that a pretty clear definition of a work? And so then a, so then resting would be what? What would resting be? Well, it can't be doing something to get. It can't be meeting a condition in order to receive. We know that Romans eleven six, Paul says that so then if it is of works, it is no longer on the basis of grace. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. So that text gives us a little help in figuring out what is the definition of rest because the author gives the uh, gives another opposite of works and he says grace is the opposite of works. And so then grace would be a synonym. The word synonym means it's another word that you could use in place of that word that means the same thing. Grace would be a synonym of rest because we know that the opposite of rest is working. So to enter his rest would be to enter his grace. How can you enter his grace? Well, the, the, the scripture here, here tells us through faith, through faith. Well, does that mean that faith is a condition? No. No, it can't be because then that would mean that faith is a work. That would mean that faith is the, is, uh, the opposite or, or the same as works. But faith is not the same as the concept of works. The author will tell us in Hebrews chapter 11 that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So if faith is assurance or confidence, can you have assurance as a condition? Can you be assured of something before you have it? If assurance was a condition that you met in order to receive something, you would have to be assured of what you don't even have before you get it because what faith is assured of is the favor of God. What faith is assured of is the salvation of God that Christ accomplished on the cross. So therefore, faith cannot be a condition that you meet in order to receive because faith is the confidence of what you receive. Therefore, you have to have it at the moment of, at least, that you have the said salvation. And that's how God saves. That's how God gives grace. And when he gives the gift of faith in time, at that very moment, he declares you righteous on the basis of Christ's work. He makes the declaration. What is the declaration? It's a statement. God says this man is righteous. He makes the declaration that you are righteous, that you are not guilty. That you are, I no longer see your sin. That your sin is cast far away from you. He justifies you. He imputes to you the righteousness of Christ. And that is favor. That is grace. And it's all the gift of God. When you hear the voice of the shepherd. And your heart is not hardened. 
But yet God gives you a new heart through the preaching of the true gospel. And what does the true gospel say? What does the true gospel say? It, it tells of the accomplished rest or salvation or favor of God. That is what the gospel tells us of. When he said in verse 10, or let's start, when he said in verse 9 and verse 10, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. You could say there remains therefore salvation for the people of God. There remains therefore favor for the people of God. And then he says in verse 10, for he who has entered his rest has also ceased from his works as God did from his. That's the gospel. For Christ has entered his rest. He is resurrected with a new body that will never see the effects of the curse of the fall again. It will never taste death again. He has entered his rest. He has ceased from his works. Christ has. His works are finished. He ceased from them. And it's on this basis that there remains therefore, what does it say in verse 9? There remains therefore a rest for the people of God because Christ has ceased from his works. Because Christ's work is finished. That's what he said on the cross. Paid in full. It is finished. It is done. And he died and he was buried for three days and three nights. And then he rose again. Demonstrating to everyone publicly in a public place. He was seen by over 500 witnesses. And it demonstrates to everyone that there, it, there remains a rest for the people of God. That's what it demonstrates. There therefore remains a rest for the people of God. Therefore, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If you are his, believe in this gospel. He has accomplished salvation. On the cross, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for the elect. That's who that letter is written to. The saints of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21. That's what he is saying. God took the sin, all the sin that his elect would ever commit, and not just actions, their persons. That's what we are by nature is sin. He took who the elect were as sinners, and he charged that to his son. And when his son hung on the cross, God the Father poured out his wrath on the son. And Jesus Christ satisfied that wrath after he had lived a perfect, righteous life under the law of God. Jesus Christ worked. To give his people rest. He accomplished the work that God had given him to do. He lived a righteous life on their behalf. He died the death that they deserved to die under the wrath of Almighty God. He was made to drink the wine of the wrath of God. Mixed in full strength. And he drank it dry. And because I can look metaphorically speak of that cup today that if you could take that cup in the garden of Gethsemane that Jesus prayed over and he said, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And as he prayed, he became, he became in anguish and he began to sweat. As droplets of blood, his sweat became like droplets of blood. 
when you read of some of the people who said that they believed in the gospel being killed for the sake of their faith, some of them went away to be burned, decapitated, crucified, etc., singing hymns, counting it joy. Think about this thought. These people were mere men. This is God incarnate. God in the flesh, without sin, without fault. This is deity. Way better than what I am, what you are. Way stronger, mentally, physically, emotionally, everything. And yet he is in anguish. Praying three times, if possible, Father, Remove this cup from me. But if not, let your will be done. Why would mere men go away joyfully? Counting it a joy. To be killed for the sake of the faith. To be tortured, some of them. Jesus Christ is in this garden. Sweating droplets as though of blood. In anguish, grieved. Asking, Father, if it's possible, let this cup be removed from me. It's because Jesus Christ, what saves people, is not the fact that the Romans took him and scourged him and whipped him and beat him and spit on him and mocked him and ridiculed him. All of that is not what he prayed over to be removed from him. That's not what was in the cup. That's what the men who were killed for the sake of the faith, that's what they had to experience. Torture at the hands of other men. Physical pain. That's how they could count it joy because they didn't have a cup to drink. Because what was in the cup was the wrath of of God. That when Jesus Christ was made to be sin, he would be made to drink the wine of the wrath of God on the cross. That's why he prayed as he did in the garden. But the good news is for the people of God is that there therefore now remains a rest for the people of God because I can take that cup and when I turn it over, it's empty. It's empty. There's no more wrath in it. Because he took that cup that I should be made to drink in the lake of fire, and he drank all of it for me. Because he loved me. When I hated him. When I did nothing but express hatred towards God, God took the hell that I deserve to experience and he drank it. And he established my rest so that I could enter it and he did it all and in time he comes and he brings it to me and he applies it through giving me faith even when I didn't do nothing. He gives me no conditions to meet. Even when I thought that I had to, when I was in false religion and he saves me from all of that and causes me to believe his truth so that I know him and who he is and he gives me a heart to love him. Because he loves me. And even though I don't even deserve it now, as a Christian, it's all free. That's why it's all rest. It's all rest because I'm not doing anything to receive it. I'm just resting. 
And in that rest, I'm free to obey him. And I have a heart that wants to. Never perfect. But it doesn't matter in the sight of God because he doesn't see me. When I say it doesn't matter, I don't mean sin so that you grace may abound. I mean, it, he doesn't take that into view when he looks at me. He doesn't see that. When, when, when he, when he accepts me, he accepts me on the basis of what his son did for me. He dis disciplines me because he loves me when I sin. And his discipline is hard because it works. Because it's effective. Like everything he does is effective. Everything he does is perfect. And God's people rest in that. And they love him for it because he first loved us. And knowing that love, we're compelled to obey him, to worship him in spirit and in truth, to read his word that we might know him more, that we might know more of who he is. And when we read of what he has said, of what is what is right and what is wrong, we agree with him. We're in agreement with him, even when it brings us into difficult situations in our lives, even when it places us in places of solitude, even when it makes us lonely, even when it does things to our flesh that we don't like, we don't compromise because he's working in us to keep us in the faith. And we know that the faith that he has given us is the antithesis of self-righteousness and works and lawlessness and everything that is in, in contrast to good doctrine. So that is the rest that remains for the people of God, the rest that Christ accomplished on behalf of those that the Father had given to him. And the author of Hebrews tells us, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, it is accomplished. It is finished. There's nothing left to do. Is this the rest you believe in? Is this the good news that you believe? Have you been made to hear the voice of the shepherd? Have you been given eyes to see and ears to hear? Do not harden your hearts. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for your work. The work that you've purposed from the foundation of the world to demonstrate who you are and the love that you have for your son. <laughs> And in him, the love that you have for your people. Lord, we pray that you would gather your people to yourself. That you would cause them to be worshipers of you. That you would give them a faith that is the same as ours. That was accomplished by the righteousness of Christ when he died on the cross. We pray that you would work in your people who you have regenerated day by day that you would cause them to mortify the deeds of the flesh and to walk in the spirit, to put on the new man and that make no provision for the flesh. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us as our advocate when we sin, when we fall. We pray that you would encourage us this week and cause us as people who are eagerly waiting your return knowing that you will come again when the last one of your sheep is born again to tell others your gospel, that they would hear your voice and that they would come to you, that they would believe in the truth and depart from the lie of false religion. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.